the remarkable diversity of science. Not only are Ram and I originally from different countries, we, we live on different, different shores, we studied in different fields, and we got a PC and a Mac. So, um, in fact, science can handle almost anything. It's really wonderful. So let me get you a magenta scribbler, and we should be ready to roll here. Um, thank you. It's an honor and a privilege, and to follow Ram is such a thrill. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit about future surprises and some things we're pretty sure of, what we've learned from the ice sheets. And let's um, maybe put it in a different way. Let's see if we can figure out how to tame the long tail of the distribution that Ram was showing you there just a minute ago. All right. Start somewhere else, though. Many of you, like me, like Ram, are scientists here, and most of the time we're sort of nice, friendly, uh, modest human beings. We don't brag in front of our students very often, but you know something? We've got the best job and the best job description of anybody out there. I mean, what's the job description? Like, go out and learn what nobody else in the world knows, share it with other people, and help them use that knowledge to do useful things. Right? That's the idea. You know, and yeah, our university thinks that's research, teaching, and service, but that's what we do. Learn what nobody knows and share it with people and help them. And if you don't believe that, you just saw it. Okay? How to help people by, by using science. You just saw it there. Okay? And we do this by the scientific method, and we all learned this in fourth grade, and it was a list of words that included hypothesis somewhere in there. But what really are we doing is, first of all, making the recognition that there's a whole lot of smart people in the world and that we probably ought to learn from them, and learning from them should not be predicated on whether we're closely related to them genetically or ideologically. They're smart. We should learn from them. And the second piece is to recognize when we learn from these smart people that they are human and that the smart as they are, we can do better. We can find new ideas. We can test those new ideas. We can keep the best ones. We have to work really, really hard not to fool ourselves. And that's probably the biggest piece of the scientific mechanism is making sure that the idea works against nature and we're not fooling ourselves. And that piece of it is where we get in trouble with the world, because what that piece says is, thou shalt argue. And if you're going to be a scientist, you spend your life tearing, trying to tear down what other people did. And if you fail, it's got to be really good, and it's got to be really solid. And as a consequence of that, if we inside know we're arguing, and we inside sort of have a pretty good idea what's solid and what's speculative and what's just silly. And the people outside, the policymakers, don't. And they lift the lid of science and they look under and what do they see? Us arguing. And they slam the lid down and they run away in terror. And this is... <laughs> This is something that has driven them crazy for years. And what's happened finally is that the, 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 the policy makers who are really thinking about this say we need assessment of science. They said we need to get the scientists to sit down, to agree to act for the public good, to agree to act in the public eye, usually on their own nickel, not the governments, to get the full range of views, and then to tell what do we know, what don't we know, what is solid, what is speculative, what is just silly. Now, this is not a new idea. In the United States, you know, right down here someplace, in the United States back in 1863, 18, there was a little bit of problem, as some of you know, and Abe Lincoln said, you know, I need some good advice. He said, I've got to get these people to act for the country and tell us what they know. And so he got Congress to charter the National Academy of Sciences, and it serves as the advisor on science to the government. And it gets the whole range of views. And some of these so-called skeptical scientists on climate have served on the committees of the National Academy, and they have signed on the dotted line what I'm going to show you next. It's a very interesting thing. Other countries have their national academies. The, the, nas the main uh, professional bodies have, have their uh, assessment. The United Nations for climate, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, get the world scientists, get a representative of all the nations, of all the peoples, of all the views, get them to sit down in the public view, agree to act for the public, and tell the policymakers what they know. What I'm going to show you next, some of what Ram was showing you, is the assessed science. 
This is what comes out of the world scientists, not one individual pushing their own particular thing. You will occasionally see the press say, well, the IPCC says this, but this person disagrees. That's false balance. There is no comparison between those two. And you will find this if you go read the assessment. So what do we know if we look at the climate question from the assessed literature? What we know is many things. We are raising CO2. We are otherwise changing the atmosphere in ways that are changing the climate with high scientific confidence. This is affecting ecosystems. This is affecting economies. The changes that we have seen are large enough that we can test our understanding of them. We can demonstrate that models that were run in the past are skillful. We can demonstrate that they have made projections that actually are being borne out. The changes are large enough that many people in many parts of the world know about it, and the changes are small enough that people in some parts of the world don't know about it unless they're paying attention. It is still possible on a cold morning in Pennsylvania for my neighbor to say, hey, don't you love that global warming? <laughs> okay, it, this, this still does happen, okay? <laughs> um, okay. Um, if we take the models that are proven skillful against the changes that have occurred and which are scientifically unequivocal, and we run those models into this future, our neighbors will not have any doubt about what's coming. The changes so far are very small compared to the changes that can come under business as usual. That's the assessed science. It's fairly straightforward. This confidence is now as high. What do we find? The damages from this grow to exceed the costs of doing something about it. If you take your climate model, you couple it to an economic model, and you say, let's just make people as wealthy as we can, what does come out is you should be investing now to head these changes off. You also should be investing now to help the people who are already being impacted and will be impacted by the things that are unavoidable at this point. If you were to come visit us at Penn State and you run across campus from where I live, you'd go over and talk to the Rock, Rock Ethics Institute, and the ethicists would say, okay, that's your economic optimization, which is get started now. But they'd say, you know something? There's a big ethical issue or two or three here. And the simplest way to put it is those people who are least responsible for global changes are the people who are most impacted by global change. And the ethicists and many others would say, you know, is that right? And so they would say, maybe you should be doing more. The economic analysis says invest now, but maybe you should be investing a little more now because there are ethical considerations in here. The costs are highly uncertain because they depend on things that aren't invented yet. They depend on things that we know the sketch of. But overall, the, the sketch is that if we were to get serious about this in a small number of decades, you can generate the things that we now enjoy from energy cleanly in a carbon neutral way for something like 1% of the world economy per year. And I can spin that in various ways for you. I can, oh, it's just 1%. I can say, that's almost a trillion dollars a year, okay? And it's the same thing. And you know you can spin this in various ways, but it's not the end of the world huge impossible to do. And this comes out, working group two, working group three, the, the German government, others have looked at this, and these are the sort of numbers that come. 